Okay, hello everyone, and welcome back to this tutorial series on the theory of computation. In this video, we'll be discussing non-regular languages. And so to do that, we're first going to introduce intuitively what a non-regular language has to look like. Then we're going to introduce two main methods for showing, for proving formally that a language is not regular. And so the first way we're going to see how to do that is using the pumping lemma. And so, in fact, this is going to be the pumping lemma for regular languages because there's more than one pumping lemma. So we're going to present the pumping lemma, give some intuition as to what exactly it says, and then we're actually going to see examples of using the pumping lemma to prove that a language is not regular. And then we're also going to see that the closure properties, which we initially saw as ways of proving that some more complex language was regular, we'll also see can be used to disprove that a language is regular. In other words, it can be used to show that a language is not regular as well. Okay. So to start us off, let's try to find some intuition as to what a non-regular language could be. Okay. So what does that look like? Because so far, what we've seen regular languages okay so let me just remind you oops uh, i'll remind you of the notion of regular languages so suppose we have some non-empty alphabet sigma okay so sigma could could say be um, the alphabet a b okay and we have some language which we just said is a subset, L is just a subset of sigma star. Okay, so in other words, it's just a subset of all the possible strings over AB. Okay, and so in our discussion of regular languages, we saw that L is regular if and only if, and we can do this three ways, right? So we can show that our language is regular in three different ways. So the first thing we could do is we could create M a DFA such that the language accepted by M is equal to L. Okay, so we defined what a DFA was. We defined what it means for a language to accept strings and by extension, accept a language. And we saw that by definition, essentially, L is regular if there exists a DFA that accepts it. Okay. Now, we saw that not only can we use deterministic finite automata, we can also use non-deterministic finite automata. Okay. So we saw that if we can find um, an NFA N okay, such that the language accepted by oops, not M, by M is equal to L, then this will also prove or demonstrate that the language L is regular, okay? And so essentially what this tells us, while I fiddle around here, essentially what this tells us is that DFAs and NFAs have exactly the same computational power. And we saw that this is true because if you have a DFA, then almost by definition, it is also an NFA. And if we have an NFA, then we can determine the NFA such that we convert it into a DFA. And remember the logic behind that was that we just accounted for all the possible choices that the NFA could make at a given state reading a certain letter, right? And so we can go from here back to here by the conversion or determination algorithm. Okay, excellent. And lastly, we also showed that L is regular if and only if there exists a regular expression R such that 
the language denoted by R, and we define this recursively, is equal to L. Okay, and we saw that this is also equivalent to these two other methods of proving that L is regular, because we can take any regular expression R and convert it almost trivially to an NFA, right? So there's a conversion algorithm for regular expressions to NFAs. And there's also a conversion alg algorithm from DFAs or NFAs to regular expressions, right? So I think we, we defined the conversion algorithm of P to be for FAs in general. Um, you can think of it specifically for DFAs or for NFAs. It doesn't really matter because both are interchangeable through the conversion algorithms. And so I'll just say that if you just have an FA, then we saw a conversion algorithm to get you an equivalent regular expression. Okay. And so this is what it means for a language to be not regular. Um, sorry. This is what it this is what it means for a language to be regular. Now, what does it mean for a language to be not regular? So what does not regular look like? Okay. Well, essentially, because this is an if and only if, you can think of it as being, um, if you apply the negation, right, to both elements of the if and only if, so if you say that L is not regular, then this must mean that there does not exist, for instance, a DFA M such that L of M is equal to L. Otherwise, if there were, L would be regular, right? So what this means intuitively is that L has some characteristic that cannot be recognized by a DFA, okay? So the intuition here that you should kind of think of is that L has some property, some intrinsic property that a um, DFA cannot recognize. And this property, in fact, has exactly to do with the fact that DFAs are finite automata. And so the limitation of DFAs, right? So the limitation of DFAs is their memory, right? A DFA has a finite number of states, okay? So it can remember a finite amount of things. So it has a finite number of states, which means that it has a finite memory. So this might still be very hand wavy. And so let's look at a concrete example to see exactly what I mean by finite memory is the limitation of DFAs. And so to do that, we can look at the classic example of A and B N. So um, you might have already seen this example, and in, in which case you know that A and B N is not regular. If you haven't seen this example already, then you can just believe me for now that A and B N is not regular. It's going to be proved formally with the pumping lemma. But what I want to do here is I want to give you the intuition um, as to how to recognize that some language is not regular because. What you're going to be doing further down the line is you're going to try to, given a language, first determine whether or not it's regular and then prove your statement, okay? So to do that rather quickly, you need to start developing an intuition as to what a regular language might look like and um, how a non-regular language um, differs from a regular language, right? And so, like I said, it's the memory limitation that's the problem. So in this case, L is A and B N, which essentially means that you have um, N number of A's, right? So any string in L is 
n number of a's followed by n number of b's, right? And so what you have to recognize here is that um, what this means is that the number of a's has to exactly match the number of b's, right? So the number of a's has to equal the number of b's. And so you might think of this um, as a human, how could you actually check that um, you had, say, a string and that there was an equal number of A's and B's? Well, what you could do, really, if you were a human, at least this is what I would do, is I would read the string, right? So I would read the string and I would count, right? I would count the number of A's that I see, okay? And then I would remember, right? So I would remember the number of A's, okay? Store that in some place, right? Store that in some place in my brain, right? Or jot it down on a piece of paper, okay? And then start reading B's. Count the number of B's, right? Count the number of B's. And then check that this count is equal to the number of A's, right? Well, remember here, N can be anything, right? You can have an arbitrarily long string. And so what this means is that um, what I need to do as a human is that I need to be able to remember any number of A's that I see, right? So if I see five A's, then I have to remember those five A's, right? I have to remember that I saw five A's, okay? And then when I see the B's, I have to make sure, I have to count the B's and check that this cor corresponds with the number of A's that I've remembered, okay? And so um, the, the insight here, right? So what's the key insight is that um, you need for every possible possible count of A's, you need to remember it exactly, okay? But see here, there isn't any bound on the number N here, right? N is unbounded, okay? N is unbounded. And so what that means, if you translate this logic into a DFA or just into an FA to make things slightly easier, right, is you need to have, say, one branch, okay, one branch for the number of A's equal the number of B's equal zero, right? So that would just be the empty string. Then you would have to have another branch for the number of A's equal to the number of B's equal one, okay? Then again, you would need another branch for the number of A's equals the number of B's equals two, right? So that would be one A transition here, another A transition here, then a B and a B, right? And so on, right? So you need to do this for number of A's equals the number of B's equals three, four, five, and so on, forever, right? Forever, right? Because N can be arbitrarily large, right? And so in that case, your memory has to grow and grow forever, right? So clearly, this isn't a finite amount of memory that's going to be required here. You're going to have to require, you, you essentially require an infinite amount of states, right? So intuitively, intuitively, the number of states grows in an unbounded fashion. Unbounded fashion, right? The number of states grows in an unbounded fashion and so 
you cannot create a finite automata. Okay, it's simply not possible because if you were to restrict the number of states that your machine could use, then that would mean that at some point you would have to start cutting off um, the amount of transitions you remember, right? At some point, if you put a bound on the number of states in your machine, then this bound is directly connected to how many A's you can remember, right? So past that bound on the number of states, you're not going to be, be able to remember those A's. And so you're not going to be able to check that those A's, right, that those number of A's you saw correspond to the number of B's. Okay, and so intuitively, this is what gives you a non-regular language. It's some characteristic, some property that isn't reducible, let's say, to a finite number of states. Okay, so, and this property here, right, so the characteristic, the characteristic of the language ANBN, right, such that it requires an infinite, and I'll put this in air quotes because what does that really mean? An infinite number of states is the need to match, right? It's the need to match any arbitrary number of A's with um, a following sequence of Bs with number of Bs, okay? And so what I think is actually useful, right? What I think is actually useful is, okay, so we have the intuition that this language A and B N is not regular. Now, and I'm saying that it's, it's the fact that you have to match the number of A's and the number of B's. And it's also the fact that the number of A's grows in an unbounded fashion, right? So N can be arbitrarily big. And so you can contrast that with a very similar language. Let's say I'll write down the language A, N, uh, let's say A, N1, B, N2, such that N1 mod 2 is equal to N2 mod 2, right? So here there's an equality, right? But the equality is based on mod two, on a base two. And so what mod two requires, it requires two states, right? It's a parity bit, right? Either um, an integer mod two is zero or an integer mod two is one, right? And so the FA that you need to build to accept this language, right? So there's still an equality here but now you don't have to remember an arbitrarily large number of, of things, right? You don't need an unbounded amount of memory. In fact, the amount of memory you need is bounded because there are two cases that you need to consider, right? So for this language, either n1 mod 2 is equal to zero, and and two mod two is equal to zero, or and one mod two is equal to one, and and two mod two is equal to one. Otherwise, you just re reject, right? Reject any other string. String, right? And so we can just create an NFA, right? To model that, right? So um, let's create a, a lambda transition, right? And so I keep track of my number of A's, right? So this is an even number of A's, and this is an odd number of A's, but it's also zero mod two, and this is one mod two, right? And so I only transition if I'm able to from the um, zero mod two state, right? So um, 
if I see that I can have an even number of Bs, right, then I transition. Okay. So this will encode uh, an even number of Bs, and this will encode an odd number of Bs. Okay. And I only transition if I see an even number of A's, then I go to the number of B's, and again, I see an even number of B's, right? So then I only transition out to a final state if I was in um, the even number of states for A's and the even number of states for B's, right? And so this takes care of a whole half of a case, right? So this takes care of all of this case, okay? And so it's going to be very similar for this other case, right? So for this other case, oops. Right, I'm just going to say similar to above, except that now you can only transition um, with this empty transition if you're in the odd number of states in both cases, right? And so what I wanted to show you here is that an equality doesn't necessarily mean non-regularity, okay? It's the fact that here I had an equality of number of A's and number of B's, and because what that equality meant is that I needed to remember an unbounded amount of things, right? I needed to remember any possible number of A's, right? So my, you can think of it as my, the potential cases, right, of what I need to remember, that is unbounded. There's an unbounded number of cases there. But here, there's only two cases, right? There's only two cases I need to remember. Either I have an even number of A's, and I match that with an even number of B's, or I have an odd number of A's, and then I match that with an odd number of B's. Otherwise, I just uh, I just reject, right? And so um, this could be created with a finite number of states, but this could not. And the distinction wasn't the fact that there was an equality or not. It was in the fact that um, in the first, right, in, in the first version here, I had to consider an infinite number of cases really and here i ha i only need to consider a finite number of cases okay so hopefully this gives you a good general intuition as to what a non-regular language might look like um, in the next videos we're going to study this a bit more formally and we're going to see how we can actually prove that a language is not regular